Alrighty guys, welcome back to the shop. In today's video, we will be making a bird and trap knife along with a leather sheath. If by the end of this video you like this design, I will be putting a copy of the PDF plans for both the knife and the sheath template on my Patreon. First step of the process is to cut out our template and then glue it onto a piece of 1084. I then cut out the 1084 roughly on the bandsaw and refine the profile with a 2x72 belt grinder and a 60 grit ceramic belt. Having your work rest square to the platen really helps with the finishing process later on in the build. Once we have the profile roughed in with the belt, we will be adding a sharpening choil and then later some jimping on the spine. For our sharpening choil, I like to first put in a guide groove with a triangular file and then we can file it in with a 3 16 of an inch train saw file. I'll then be putting some jimping on the spine with a checkering file. I get a lot of questions on this checkering file and if you'd like this checkering file in your arsenal, check out the links in the description below. Once we have the blade profiled, sharpening choiled, and jimped, we will be drilling some holes in the tang to accept our handle scales. In this case we will be drilling four main holes along with some weight reduction holes. The four main holes will be two number 28 holes for our loveless fasteners, one number 30 hole in the middle for a decorative eighth of an inch pin, and then one letter F hole in the back for a lanyard tube. I will be drilling these holes in my mini mill and to do so I put a 1-2-3 block on a set of parallels in my vise and then I put a 3 8 by 16 of an inch stud in that 1-2-3 block to act as a backstop and prevent the chances of helicoptering. So you can see I also use ample cutting fluid for all these holes to prolong the life of my bits. Now that we have the holes drilled, the jimping in the spine, the choil filed in to our edge, and the profile roughed out, we will be heat treating this blade. I generally like grinding my bevels post heat treat, uh, mainly just out of personal preference. I like only suiting up once and it's more convenient for me to just use nice fresh belts and suit up for grinding once. I figured for this video I'd give the two brick forge a go for heat treating this blade. If you're interested in building your first forge, uh, I would recommend this two brick forge since it was a very easy and cheap build. I will put the cards in the top right side of your screen for a full tutorial on building this forge. Using my straightening jig, I clamped the blade after a quench and it came out nice and straight. I then file tested the blade just to verify that it is hard. A lot of people ask about file testing. So you can hear the difference here. The first piece of steel I was using is a soft annealed piece of 1084. And then you can hear the difference when file testing my blade. It skates across the blade and does not dig in and gives a higher pitch sound when you are filing it. I then do two tempering cycles in my oven. And while I'm doing so, I start preparing the handle scales. I will be putting in some G10 liners on two pieces of winge. Winge has a reputation for blowing out when drilling, and you will see how we combat that later in the video. Once we run our two tempering cycles at around 410 degrees Fahrenheit, we will start grinding on our blade. The first thing I like to do is clean up the profile of the blade with a 220 grit belt. After doing so, I will clean up the flats. We'll do this in my case with the DIY surface grinder that I built in a previous video. However, if you don't have one of these, you can just use a magnet and the platen on your 2x72 and get pretty close. This is what the finish looks like with a 220 grit cork belt in the surface grinder. Once I have one side done, I will tape the other side so as not to scratch it when I drag it off the magnetic chuck and then we'll get back to surface grinding the other side of the blade. If I had a fancy magnet that was able to turn on and turn off, this would not be an issue and I would not need to use that tape in between operations. So we work up to a 220 grit J-Flex belt and then put some green buffing compound on a 220 grit cork belt for our final surface ground finish here of a 220 grit cork belt finish. Using a DIY height scribe that I built out of a carbide scribe and a 1-2-3 block, we scribe a center line into our edge so that we have a target to grind to. 
I like using this 45 degree angle jig in the beginning just so I can nail that center line and it gives me a good basis to start off the rest of my grinding. Notice that I am dipping the blade in water every pass to keep it cool since this is a heat treated blade. If you didn't heat treat your blade before grinding the bevels, you can grind with gloves on potentially and get the blade a lot hotter than what I normally do post heat treat. But since we don't want to run our temper, we dip the blade every pass. We're going to be putting what I like to call a working stone washed finish on this blade. So I will grind it up to a 120 grit J-Flex belt before hitting it with a Scotch-Brite belt and stone washing the blade. So this is what that 120 grit finish looks like before hitting it with the Scotch-Brite. I find that the Scotch-Brite kind of gives it a more satin look and smooths everything out nicely. So this is what it looks like post Scotch-Brite belt. Once we have our grinding done, I decided to go and clean up the Ricasso area briefly with a piece of 320 grit sandpaper and also clean up the sharpening choil. Before stone washing the blade, I will be etching in my maker's mark with this Chris Crawford DIY etching machine. I get these stencils from TUS Industries and I think they come in packs of five or six. They last about 10 to 15 knives each, so uh, it's a pretty good investment there on the stencils. Once I have my maker's mark cleaned up, I put it in ferrochloric acid mixed 50-50 with water for about two or three minutes, take it out, hit it with the steel wool, and then repeat the process three or four times. Once we achieve the desired darkness, we will start tumbling the knife in this jig. I got this idea from 921 Forge. Uh, he's another YouTuber and I saw him using a jig like this, so I decided to build one myself. I'm just using general rocks from a home and garden type store, uh, but you could use some ceramic media if you want. I'm sure it would give you a slightly different result. I tumbled the blade for about 15 minutes in this jig. If y'all haven't seen my recent video on how to make loveless fasteners, uh, this is some footage from that video. And basically what we do here is just drill a hole in a piece of quarter inch rod and tap it to 632 threads. After we have it tapped, we'll cut off two pieces and then we'll have a loveless fastener. For this knife, I produced two of those loveless fasteners with a center bolt of 316 stainless and an outer nut of 303 brass. Before drilling the handle scales, I like to get them cleaned up and squared up on the belt sander and then flattened on my granite surface plate. I then clamp the two handle scales together in their appropriate orientation onto the blade so that we can use the blade as a drill guide. As I mentioned earlier, this winch has a tendency to blow out on the exit side of the drill bit. So in order to combat this, I put down some scrap pieces of micarta so that the bit will not come out of the back of the scales without contacting something. And this seemed to work pretty darn good. I didn't have any major blowout issues on this winch. So once I have all of the holes drilled, we'll move on to the next step of the process, which will be rough cutting out the profile of the handle. I like to do this up front before gluing the handle scales onto the knife so that I don't risk cutting into the blade and so I can reduce the amount of grinding I have to do on the 2x72. This allows me to get really close to my scribe lines and just overall reduce the amount of material that I have to grind away. You can see here that I'm using the side of the platen to get into this radius and get close to my scribe lines. Another necessary operation on these handle scales before gluing them onto the tang and knife is to clean up the front of the handle scales because you will not be able to mess with the front of the handle scales after they're glued on to the knife. I like using a 45 degree angle jig, grinding them in roughly and then finishing them off with some sandpaper in my vise. I got these up to around a 1500 grit finish. For those of you who saw my recent video on loveless fasteners, you will know that I now love this counterbore. This counterbore with the changeable inserts is a really nice tool to have around the shop for both loveless fasteners and for Corby fasteners. So I put in the pilot for the loveless fasteners 
and got to counterboring away. I made sure to set my mill so that the counterbores were all at the same depth. Gluing up on this knife was actually a little more complex than most of my build, just because we have four components that we will be passing through the handle scales. I start off by putting some epoxy on the threads of my loveless fasteners and getting one side pressed in to my counterbores. I then apply epoxy to the inside of that handle scale. Moving on to the next handle scale, I'll apply epoxy to the inside first and then put a little bit of epoxy into the counterbores that these loveless nuts will sit into. I then apply some epoxy to the tang itself and then start screwing the entire assembly together. Using my impact driver, I make sure to be extremely careful here because you do not want to over torque these loveless fasteners. If you over torque a loveless fastener or a Corby fastener, you will force the epoxy out of the joint and actually have a bad joint with the epoxy all being squeezed out. Using a Q-tip and some rubbing alcohol, we clean up the front of the handle scales and then let this cure for 24 hours. After the curing process, we start cleaning up the profile and the sides of the handle. While cleaning up the profile of the handle, I am cognizant of how close I am getting to the tang and I will switch to a higher grit 220 grit belt right before I start scratching the tang with my belts. This prevents any majorly large, deep 60 grit scratches. I'm going to be coke bottle shaping this handle and I got this technique from Rob McKibben on Instagram. The first step is to taper the handle scales from the front to the back and then you can use a contact wheel like an 8 inch contact wheel I have here to start hollowing out your back end of the handle. To get everything as symmetrical as possible, I like to put a pencil mark in the center of the handle around the same place my two middle fingers will land. Once we have the coke bottle shaping roughed in, we will use a J-Flex scalloped one inch belt to smooth over the edges and then off to hand sanding. I'm going to be bringing these handles up to a 1500 grit hand sanded finish. When you're sanding something like a loveless fastener, that has any type of stainless steel in it or even brass, you want to use hard backing in the rough stages of your hand sanding. If you don't do this, you'll have a domed effect where you'll take off more of the wood than the metal and you'll actually be able to feel it when holding a knife, which is not desirable. The last thing we're going to do on the knife here is get it nice and sharp with the wind water cooled sharpening system. This system works very well if you have a knife that has a sharpening choil or something like a buoy where you can grind all the way off the edge of the edge. If you have a plunge line that does not have a sharpening choil, I find that the edge of the stone will gum up your plunge lines and look terrible. So this is how the knife turned out. I really like the way the white liners and the black liners look with this winch. The loveless fasteners are always a classy look in my opinion. And I just, I like the overall look of this knife, so I was pretty happy with how it turned out. Now that we have a good looking knife, we need to put it inside of a good looking sheath. I'm going to be using some 7 to 8 ounce leather from Wicked and Craig that has been pre-dyed. To transfer the template onto the leather, I use an awl here to poke some holes around my template. This will allow me to connect those dots with my head knife later. I'm also using this half circle punch to punch out some of the curves in the sheath and it just makes cutting a little bit easier, especially at the top of the belt loop here. I recently made this head knife in its own video. Uh, I'm still getting used to the technique of using a head knife, so I'm going really slow and being very careful so as not to mess up uh, my leather work. But once you get the hang of it, I'm finding that it's actually pretty easy to use. The cutting board that I'm using is a little soft, I think, for this knife, and the knife will actually cut into the cutting board, causing me to kind of get hung up here and there when I'm cutting out templates. So I will probably take the advice of Mr. Dave Ferry and get a high-end cutting board. So this is what it all looks like after I cut it out. I go ahead and I clean up the edges on the top of the sheath because this is the best time to do it. I edge them with an edge beveler and then I slick them down with some sandpaper and a burnisher. 
So I've recently been following some of the workings of Mr. Paul Long. He's a legendary sheath maker. And so I tried using some of his techniques in this sheath build here. Before I start tooling the front of the sheath, I'm going to press in at my maker's mark on the back. I got my stamp from Ghost Graphics and they will print you a custom stamp out of plastic. Mr. Dave Ferry recently put a tutorial up on Bladeforms about how to stamp in a basket weave. So I am going to be following in his footsteps here and stamping a basket weave on the front of my sheath. So you can see I have a couple mishits there and I'm using some older, cheaper Chinese made punches that the tops of the punches were a little domed. So I went to the belt sander and flattened those out and I didn't have any mishits after that. It's just unfortunate that I had those mishits while working on the sheath itself. So you can see that I marked a diagonal line and then I started putting in my basket weave stamp. This is also a cheap Chinese stamp here and you can see that the impression is not as good as it could be, or at least not as deep as I think it could be. I recently ordered a better basket weave stamp uh, that has a deeper impression, so y'all will be seeing that one in the future. I took this opportunity to oil the inside of the belt loop and the top of the sheath. This is a tip by Mr. Paul Long because he says this is the best time to do it. I then mark off where my stitching will be on the belt loop with a washer and then use a pricking iron to lay out where my stitches will be. I'm not actually pricking all the way through the sheath. I'm just using this to lay out the spacing of my stitches. I'll bring it over to the drill press, which I have a needle in the drill press spinning and I press through where my stitches will be. This is not a drill bit. I think that uh, there's nothing wrong with using a drill bit, but I like not removing any of the leather when making these holes. So I use a needle. Once we have the saddle stitch on the belt loop completed with a couple of back stitches in there, we'll move on to gluing up the rest of the sheath. We'll put some barge contact cement on our welt and also on where the welt will go on the inside of both sides of our sheath. I like to put two coats of this barge, but in this case I only showed one in the video. We'll then lay down our welt into the sheath and then use a smooth face hammer to tap down the welt into the sheath. Using some barge, we'll put some more contact cement on the other side of the welt, give it a little bit of time to dry and get tacky, and then squeeze the sheath carefully together. Lining up the top of the sheath is probably of the utmost concern, next followed by the tip, and then you can line up the rest of the sheath. I then hammer it all together and bring it over to the 2x72 belt sander to level out the entire edge of the sheath. I'm using a 220 grit belt on this belt sander and running it fairly low for this operation. I'm trying not only to level out the three pieces, but I also want to make sure that the distance between the outside of the sheath and my tooling is fairly consistent. We use a number four edge beveler to knock off the edge on the sheath and then put in a stitching groove with our stitching groover. Using the pricking irons, once again, I will lay out where my holes will be drilled. You can see here on the drill press that I'm using some leather shims here. That's in an effort to keep these holes as straight as possible. I'll move these shims around as I go, depending on how the belt loop and the shape of the sheath is influencing the angle in which the needle is passing through the sheath. I start off my saddle stitch with around 10 times the total length of the stitch that I'll be performing in thread. I'm using some John James needles here and these things have not failed me yet. I find them very nice to use and I've even been pretty aggressive with pulling them with pliers and stuff and they have not broke on me yet. So I get the saddle stitch done all the way around. I throw in a few back stitches, cut the thread and then hit it with the lighter and then we can move on to finishing out our edge. I put some quick slick on the edge here uh, before I started finishing it off with some 320 grit sandpaper. You can also use some saddle soap for this application, but I just have some quick slick and I, I like the way that stuff works. So I end up getting the edge up to a 600 grit finish, putting some Neat's Foot oil on the entire sheath, and then dyeing the edge black. So this is what it all looks like after that. The last thing we'll do for this sheath is put a top coat on it. So we'll be using some bag coat 
and wiping down the entire sheet. This stuff is uh, pretty water resistant and it also gives a pretty nice shiny sheen on your leather work. Alrighty, so this is how the sheath ended up looking. You know, I think uh, my leather work has been improving over the last year. I really like the way that this sheath turned out. There are some imperfections here or there that I'll have to address in the next sheaths that I make, but this is a perfectly usable, uh, perfectly serviceable sheath uh, that in my opinion looks pretty good. This is the first time I put the knife into the sheath and the fit was as I would have expected. Not too tight, but not too loose as well. So like always, I hope you guys really enjoyed this build. If you want to build this knife and sheath, I'll put the template for both of them up on Patreon for my Patreon subscribers. If you want to see more content like this across your feed, like this video, share this video, and consider subscribing to the channel. Until the next time, I'll catch y'all on the flip side.